All right, today we have a very special guest. We have Mr. Ryan Risk, who we often refer to as the full package. Give them, look, I was admiring his teeth. Just look at, look at that smile. They're real. They're actually real teeth. Like, I know it's hard to believe, but they're actually real. Ryan has very, look at me on the screen. It says 25.50. It's 25.50 cent that we are going to be playing today. But Ryan has very generously agreed to help us or else laugh at us whilst we play some 25 50 cent Zoom on Poker Stars. Ryan is a coach at all levels, runs a coaching for profit, but also crushes the highest Zoom stakes. You will often find him on his Twitter at Poker at Risk, bragging about losing 3 or 4K at the beginning of the session, but ending up winning 3 or 4K by the end. Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully, you will find some spots where you get to laugh at me get to criticize me and hopefully make me a little bit better hopefully yeah hopefully uh did you mirror my session and start with a big downswing at the start no so this is one thing straight away at the start i don't know what size i should be using out of the small blind uh, okay like if you want to we can quickly talk about that one usually you want to go a bit smaller from the small blind uh just because you have to worry about the big blind like cold four betting so typically going like depending on their open size, like four to four and a half from the small blind and then a bit bigger from the big blind is better. Okay. And see the 10, I'm just, listen, I don't know how many times Ryan is going to grace us with his presence. So I'm going to ask as many questions as I can here. Is like 10, nine off and stuff still okay to open on the button? Like that would never dream of folding that. Especially in these games. Like if you're playing below 200 now, like three bet frequencies won't be high enough that you have to worry. So I would always like try and play as loose as you feel comfortable. Um, Within reason, obviously, but yeah, on the button, you can usually try and get away with as much as possible. All right. And the only, like, I've never played cash games. For anyone who has never uh, watched my stream, I am exclusively a tournament poker player. So the only look into cash games I've ever got is when I watch training videos, usually by Sauce. And I know he uh, doesn't tend to use a limping strategy in the small blind. So I don't know if it's a mistake, but I didn't use it here. But I feel like yeah. at the lower stakes, you'd probably get away with it, would you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's some... Because of rake at lower stakes and because of people just not defending their big blind enough, I would err on the side of just like pure raise strategy from the small blind. Pure raise? 100% or like... No, no, sorry. Like okay. any hand you want to play, oh, okay. you should raise. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. If you ever want me to pause at any point, just let me know because I'm just kind of letting it flow. But this is a flop yeah. where I wasn't sure if I should be betting or checking, but I assumed against small, I can check some. Yeah, and this cool. hand kind of goes either way. It doesn't really care. Like, you can, you're not going to get multiple streets with this hand. So, you're basically just trying to, you know, give yourself balance by betting this type of hand on the flop. And then uh, checking back is obviously good too. Are if you're going to bet flop, turn? I wouldn't. Uh, turn's fine. Like, especially when the guy's checking, I would just like read into what this player's doing. He's like kind of snap checking to you. So, does he either not... looks disinterested or he's not looking to put a lot of money in. So, I try and get some value probably on this turn. Okay, so our time and tells, because I kind of laugh at people. Now, don't get me wrong. I feel like intuitively I have some time and tells when playing poker, but I don't read into them that much. But I think in Zoom it's different, right? Because they can just fold and move on to the next hand. So do you think they're like quite important? You put a lot of em emphasis on them? Um, yeah, I would say like, especially in these Zoom formats where like, first of all, the guy flat in the small blind, typically that's going to happen like on average from a weaker opponent. And then on top of that, like the quick checks, are like if he has a really good hand, he's gonna kind of think about it on the turn at least. So they're like really quick checks means he's probably like so he could have a decent hand, but he definitely doesn't have like a really strong hand. So I would think our hands were some value on the turn, and then yeah, just a call on the river. Look at that, but, tree yeah. dude suited Ryan. Ryan with the time and tells already picked up on the opponent. I'm I'm I don't I, I did only play one table. Ryan probably expected me to play at least two tables, but I'm 30 years old now, right? And Zoom is really quick. So I just played one and hopefully it won't be too boring. But uh, is this a hand that you would ever mix or pure call at these stakes? Uh, I would only, from the cutoff, I don't really flat. Uh, I would mainly just three bet or fold. This hand's okay to mix in some calls if you think like, if you see a lot of weaker players behind you. Uh, so basically the obvious idea is like, you don't want to get squeezed out of the pot. It's worth a lot to like. Is that uh, to do with... Obviously, at the higher stakes, that, that's going to do with the fact that you've got better players behind that are going to squeeze. But if you're not flat in at all from the cutoff, is that anything to do with the rake? Or is that... It's a mix of rake. Uh, also, just like, you just think of poker in like a nutshell. Like, 
you're always trying to lose as little from the blinds and then win as much from everywhere else. So like anytime you V-pip a hand from another position, it has to like clearly be better than folding. And just due to all the factors that can happen when you flat there, like you never win the pot pre-flop. You have another player's relatively strong range opening. And then you have players behind that, you know, are going to squeeze at some frequency. And so that combination just makes like flatting from that position pretty, you have to balance it by flatting strong hands. And then you just end up losing EV with those strong hands. So it's like not really worth it, basically. So you're better off just being aggressive with the range that continues and just folding a lot. So obviously zero flatting from the cutoff. But would that mean that you probably do a lot less flatting on the button also than I am going to show up with? Like, are you uh, you can, like the button's always the spot. You can like, it's kind of like your power position. You can kind of get away with more stuff. So flatting on the button is definitely fine, especially if there's... Again, players in the blinds that you want to play against. So if you have been noting a guy, the guy who th showed up with a three do suited earlier, if we see him in the blinds, we'd probably, you know, flat a bit wider on the button so we can get involved in more pots with him. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, yeah, being really aggressive, big blind versus small blind is obviously like really good, especially at these stakes where you're playing zoom and you're playing lower stakes. So the combination of that is people just like, they want to make good hands. So they're just going to like fold a lot and try and like find the next good hand. So okay. being aggressive and just forcing a lot of folds is going to net you a lot of money. I'm, I'm firing a million questions a second here. And I know um, at some point when interesting hands come up, we will go more in depth. But I'm also true X and on the button and like 2.5 and everywhere else. Is that a thing at all? Or is that like, because that's what I do in tournaments. I tend to raise a little bit bigger. Um, so here, this one's actually interesting. So I would assume like if you think about this hand, uh, when you're currently playing like MTT spots, are you c-betting this board a lot when you like raise small blind versus big blind? Um, I would I would bet this board a lot just because I feel like it's a lot better for me. And with this hand in particular, I've obviously got the best suits for potentially like launching it off. So it's I funny because it's actually depending on his defending strategy, this board's actually better for him. Oh, um, really? Because of the low and connectedness, these like ace high wheel hands or wheel draw boards, especially with a flush draw, it's very easy for him position to defend enough against this size. And he's going to have more like gut shots with equity, uh, potentially more two pairs and obviously more straights because we don't have deuce four suited and he should defend that in this spot. Yeah. Um, so he actually has like a nut advantage and like the only like we can only leverage a hand like ace king um, and aces in this spot. He has fives and threes. So we actually don't have like a huge advantage and we're playing out of position on a board that just like develops a lot. So like you actually don't want to bet this board that aggressively. It can be fine to do what you're doing right now if you just assume he's going to like massively overfold. So if you don't expect him to float like king highs, queen highs and, you know, put your range in a tough spot with some raises, then it can be fine. But as a general strategy, you actually want to do a lot of checking on this type do of you, So do you think that's something that I should be translating over to MTTs as well. Like that's going to carry over just as much, right? Like, for yeah, sure. like not treating all ace high boards is the exact same. Um, like really giving weight to the side cards and just like the connectivity of like these like low boards, like say this flop was six, five, three. I would assume you don't have much of a betting frequency on that flop. Yeah. I'd be doing a lot of checking. Right. And so the ace feels like a lot different. Um, but like this board is so much different. If it's like King five, three, you can be like very aggressive, but like the connectivity of the fact that he defends like all ASEX and the big blinds, so he's just going to have a lot of ASEX himself so that our bluffs don't make that much money. Okay. And then the equity and stuff that backs up the rest of his range. It's just like, you're actually not going to generate a ton of auto folds here unless your opponent is just playing way too tight versus C bet. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I definitely thought that like ACE five tree would be worse in cash games for people than it would be in tournaments. I thought that you would fold out a reasonable chunk of the stuff towards the bottom of the deck. Um, obviously, in tournaments with the antis, they wouldn't. So, all right, it's interesting. I'm definitely uh, not. That's it. Look, there we go. I'm learning. I'm already better thanks to Ryan. Um, I'm the never good, borrowing. The good thing about this spot is he's probably not going to like raise a, a random four in the spot and like try and get stacks in by the river on br brick runout. So, you're not really going to be put in the tough spots he should be putting you in. So, that's like a benefit to being aggressive and see betting a bit more. Would we block on a non straight completing card with this hand, or do you think it's yeah? I think so. Because I don't I don't think he's gonna like delay bluffs to the river much. Like knowing what he had here is relevant too. Um but for, for typically sure. once he I doesn't bluff gone. turn, he's not gonna like reopen the betting on the river with bluffs that often. So you might as well get some value versus like five X and lose a bit less versus um his ace X. Okay. Yeah, that that 
that is definitely something uh, though that you broke down on the flop that I I would just auto see bet there. But like something like Ace King Four and something like you're never ever checking blind versus blind, right? Like that's like yeah, auto see bet. Yeah, just just yeah, making sure, special. just making sure. Yeah, like I would assume at fifty and all and lower, or even up to probably hundred now, people are just going to like massively overfold on like most of those flop flops. So. I'm not even saying that being aggressive on the flop you had exactly ace five three is like bad. Just be mindful that you can't get away with as much on those boards as you can on others. Where is the line where I would be absolutely drawing dead to jump into the cash games? Because I, I've obviously you haven't seen a lot of how I play so far. Also, this is actually interesting because in tournaments I would probably not be folding this king ten, um, but I got told by my friend who plays uh, Zoom up to two hundred and sometimes five hundred that like he doesn't flat at all out of small blind. So mm-hmm. this hand, then I'm not sure. Like, and it just, it, I don't know. Would you, would you mix this ever? Was a pure fold? Cause like I folded. I'm just, yeah, it mainly be a fold like as a default. And okay. so unless you have some information, like it'd be a really cuspy three bet. You could flat sometimes versus like a min raise again, if big blinds passive, okay. but for the most part, yeah, it's best off just being a fold. Okay. All right. There's well, just... let's, in, in, in case you don't insult me too much, right? Where, where is the line where, the games tend to get like very tough for someone who hasn't got much experience in cash games that they can't just translate their tournament skills over right because i think 25 50 stand if i played i should do okay would be my guess because there's so many weak players but if i jumped mm-hmm. into two five zoom i'm gonna get absolutely murked right so yeah. like, where is it usually that if players come over and you're deciding to coach them when they're formerly an mtt player that you would be like you're not going to be able to just jump into those things i would think probably even at 100 now it starts to get like somewhat not like unbeatable and like maybe you could eke out a small win rate but like that would be where your like discomfort in certain spots would start to be more apparent because okay. people start to be able to leverage bigger bet sizes and like you know put you in more uncomfortable spots for 100 big ones that you might not be that familiar with whereas at the lower stakes because bet sizes are so yeah here you... i would just stick to a three bet strategy yeah, just I, knew, I nearly i nearly did i don't know if you've seen it i did scroll up and then yeah. Just click call. I know it sounds dumb, but one of the reasons it played on my mind was I I don't actually not never mind. I, I I'm not in my mind I'm gonna say it because I I'll just I'll keep my match up. Do you think betting the swap small is okay given how my range does work with or is it yeah? I think it's fine because again, like big blind's probably not gonna check raise enough like bear five X, like not turn enough threes and fours into bluffs. So like this play that you're making right now will perform way better than it should. Okay. But against because, tough players yeah. you're just not getting away with this. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think once people call this flop, even at higher stakes, you'll probably get away with this bet more than you should because people don't like delay their bluffs enough to this turn. But I think, like, especially in these games, he's just gonna like call you twice with a six or a four. Um, like, and like you snap check river. There's actually like potential value on the river there. You could just like half bar. No, river. like I actually like. I know I did snap check it, but I on the turn I was thinking about whether I was gonna like bet them bricks, and it felt extremely close. But obviously, you would you would have tried to eke it out. Yeah, well, I mean, you see, like, he shows up with ace five. The fact that he's just, like, calling down, like, maybe he's using randomizer and he rolled low, but, like, the idea, like, he, like, just called down and, like, doesn't put that hand in his, like, aggressive line ever shows that you can kind of get away with these, like, exploitative, like, you know, kind of finished bets on the turn. What's, how are we feeling about half pot here? Like, I called, what is this, too wide in a cash game? No, uh, no, like I would definitely defend this for small sizings, especially like you have ace high and a three to a straight. Um, he's probably gonna bet this board too much, but you're probably gonna need to. Yeah, we'll just fold here. But like sometimes turn that hand into a bluff on later streets. Like you have okay showdown. It depends on what his betting range looks like, obviously. But mm-hmm. I think like continuing beyond, beyond the flop is mandatory. Yeah, I just, I just the one thing. I also wasn't sure if I got to do anything here versus one. I can't remember what I, I think- do. The fact that he doesn't have 100 big blinds and he's min raising under the gun, the combination of those things, you could probably just three bet to like, again, when you're in position in those spots, you don't have to go that big either. You can just make it like three, 3.5. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely uncomfortable the deeper we get with the more marginal hands that can't make the nuts. I know, I don't know if that's a reasonable thing to be scared of, but it just, yeah. anytime I've watched any training content, it just seems like, you don't see people playing like the raggedy hands that you'll see in tournaments because there's no antis, right? And there's not as much incentive to get involved. Um, like what, what sort of queen X like are you going down to on average on the button in these stakes? Not in your stakes because I'm sure you get punished a bit more. But like, would you be opening queen seven off? 
Uh, queen, especially if you're three xing, queen seven off might be a bit wide. Just, Probably okay. queen eight and uh, like basically so just like kind of defaulting to big cards that can make a straight as like the easy ones, and then um, going a bit wider based on like how your blinds are playing. So like you could open like king eight and maybe king seven off. Okay. So what okay. do you think on this flop? So this flop, I think it's going to be a mix in terms of batting and jagging, but. I is that I, the Finton mix where you're mainly betting? No, no. Like I actually would like. To, I I think I would actually check Ace Nine. Like I I don't know what's right, but I think I would check Ace Nine of Diamonds more than I would bet it here. And I think I would just check this board a lot versus Small Blind. I don't know how the ranges work exactly in cash games, but what I would assume that this flop is reasonable for him. Like not fantastic, but like maybe better for him than me. Um, it's, obviously I still go ahead. It's probably one of those boards that looks like when you first see it people will kind of think like, oh, this is kind of good for his range. But the boards that are really good for small blind range are more where they have like tons of like pair plus draws and stuff. And like okay. in this spot, he'll have like mainly one pair of hands, straight draws and flush draws, but he doesn't have any like, you know, he doesn't have Combo a draws. ton of hands that can really put you in gross spots. Okay. So you could like leverage pretty big bet sizes on a texture like this with like a portion of your range. And that means like you could even over bet this flop with like, you could have multiple sizings and you could overbet say like pocket tens and jacks like pretty often because those hands want to get a lot of money in right now and you want to punish him for so if he wants to develop a proper flatting range here he can in theory would have to have some very strong range let's, strong. let's ryan let's cut right through there's no way this guy playing 25 50 cent has developed a proper flatting range right so you can say like exactly. what you're really thinking like you can tell us what's going on so am yeah. i just wasting chips by betting so big with, uh, at a time. I think it's fine if you're willing to like leverage like future streets with a hand that probably shouldn't bluff. Like as an exploit, you could just like be very aggressive when you bet this size and like big cards come in and just understand that he has to kind of hero call you with like pocket sevens because of the position he's put himself in. Okay, okay, I do think I do understand like how his range works when he doesn't start raising. Like it's gonna come become very dense. Like those pocket pairs that didn't make sets right, and like some yeah. ace high with backdoor club. So. We bluff the diamonds rather than if we have clubs here and stuff like that, right? It's kind of yep. carry, carries over. No, it's yeah, not like the Finton you... mix though that I always bet. I, I I didn't have a randomizer yeah. open or anything like that. But yeah, okay. see see this like ten six off that I auto fold in the small blind. So at this stakes, would you not be auto folding that? I think ten six is probably still too wide. Like you could mix in some ten ten seven still a bit wide as well. But like okay. again, if you notice someone playing too tight, that's like the next hand you would add. Ten eight yeah. off would be like pretty standard open all right let's see what uh what size you go with here do you know like how are you currently four betting out of position just like 2.5 yeah, 2.4 yeah it seems fine in that region are you anywhere between like as long as you go like 11 to 12 like uh dollars in this spot you're not really making a mistake so 11.50 was the perfect size and is what you're telling me exactly yeah, you, you landed <laughs> on it <laughs> So on this board, I assume that I don't play 100 big blinds, 4 bet pots too regularly, but my understanding would be that 4 bet pots, we just have to kind of bet a lot. Yep. There's not going to yep. be a huge amount of checking and like Ace-8-5 is going to fall into like the category that's like auto bet and so it's going to be small. Like that's what I would think, but I don't know, do you want to leverage a larger size here sometimes because like you have Ace-King and Aces and he doesn't as much? No, or? like not on a texture like this, like for the most part, you're going to use really small sizes in four bet pots. And like, especially on this texture where it's like, he doesn't really have any straight draws. So like he might have a few flush draws, but like we can never bet a size big enough that flush draws are in a dumb spot. Yeah. Um, so our, the idea here is just like leveraging the top end of our range. And even with a hand like Kings, that might feel kind of weird to bet. It's like better than any other option because we'd rather just like keep our range uncapped on flop when we have to yeah. play two more streets out of position. That is something I feel like you'll see like the weaker players do, right? Is like they'll bet here with aces. Maybe they check ace sometimes, but then when they check, they just come really heavily weighted towards kings and queens, right? Like in four by pots. You could, like, I don't expect you to get bluffed here a ton. So you could, again, like try and get away with a really small, like, blocker Three bet on the server. Like, yeah, just like yeah. The, the MTT, like 10% pot bet. Yeah, honestly, I did consider it down the river um, for sure, but I don't know. Queen felt a bit dicey. I was not calling. I don't know why I snapped over towards the call there. I don't like I would always fall. This is a weird one because like I don't know what hand he wants to put that much money in the pot with. Like 
he either has for the most part a shove or a check behind so yeah it's kind of weird to take that size so like Would curiosity to... might yeah like but it's so hard to be bluffing in that spot i'd probably just end up calling and being wrong Ryan Risk loves a hero call more than I love a bluff. If you follow his Twitter, which is Ryan, it's our poker at risk, right? Poker yeah. Risk with the E on the end. And if you follow the hands that he calls, like he gets the cape on in impressive fashion. Like, I don't know how you make those reads that you do, but you love making the big boy hero calls. Yeah, I, I had a fun one the other day where I hear it called a regular with like for like 2x pot with like ace jack in a spot, like ace jack high in a spot where <laughs> probably shouldn't be in the in the mix, but we were right, so uh, that makes it the right call. Do you ever post them when you're wrong? Or do you just never get them uh, wrong? <laughs> I don't know if I, I, I post the hero calls where I'm wrong, but for the right reason. So like I hero call and I he was bluffing, but he is he's bluffing with a better hand than mine, that type of thing, because yeah, those yeah. are funny. Yeah, they really are. But I will, if we're going to do this again next time, Ryan, as much as I am enjoying this, I will play two tables next time so that you've got more hands to go over. Yeah. Even if it puts like you in a more flustered spot, that's almost better. Ah, like listen, I, know, I think I'd be, able, I'd be able to play two Zoom tables. I don't think I could play four tables of Zoom though, Cash. Like I've been streaming now for what, four, four or five years. And like I don't play really more than six tables. So if I was to be whacked in there with four zoom tables i could potentially have an aneurysm like it could be like pretty <laughs> pretty damaging towards my health how yeah. many how do you how many do you play and if you're so right let's say obviously at the moment you are doing a lot of coaching your stable seems to be doing incredibly well what do you recommend to players who are coming in at this level right they're playing 25 50 cent do you like try and force them to play less tables or do you let them do their own thing yeah i try i try and do like do as I say, not as I do, because I've posted some stuff recently where I got some chests and I had to unlock them in a few days. So I've had sessions where I'm eight tabling Zoom, which is like obviously insane. I think even one time I was up to 10 tables of Zoom. It's like absurd, right? You have to be able, you're not going to eke you're out not, much of a yeah. win rate. Uh, what size do we take on the river there? I missed that one. No problem. So, oh no, Fintan, Fintan, Fintan. Okay. Uh, uh, we're not too far off. Yeah, no, okay. uh, but while you, I'll answer the other question too. I usually say two tables is good. If you're playing Zoom, playing two tables is perfect because you'll get enough hands that you can like, you know, get in a good enough spots to get better. But it's not overwhelming, right? You should be able to focus, as you said. Like two tables should never get too out of hand. Uh, once you start getting to three and four, it's like way too much for someone who's just starting out. Okay, so this pot actually I check raised on the flop, um, and then I went check probably, check. Probably. Versus half pot, I probably don't do any check raising with this type of hand. Okay. Um, we'd want like either backdoor equity, so like king x with a backdoor flush draw, okay, um, or a stronger king. And this one's gonna just like prefer mainly check call. Um, but as played, I like the check raise check. Yeah, that and is... then yeah, check call. Okay, yeah, uh, like as once we check raise flop, I think it's fine. Um, but I'm gonna usually like skew more passive with that type of hand and like. Check raise my stronger king x, and then hands that can also make flushes on certain runouts. That makes sense. Are we able to flat this? I, this was a. I looked at his stack kind of job as well, but in general, am I able to be flat in six seven suited versus first position? Yeah, like you can mix, especially again with this, like with the lineup behind you. The big blind appears, you know, like he's just splashing around. So we'll be. At, I would definitely call twice here with this hand. It feels weird, but like okay. we're in, in position, we can bluff a ton of runouts, and we make the best hand on a six or a seven. Okay. Excuse I would me, basically all, always. I would follow so, her a lot, so... Maybe yeah, like, them. when you have a pair in position and, like, face that size and have the ability to bluff rivers, like, I think you're going to win the pot enough that call is better than full. Okay. Like, you beat his bluffs, and when he checks river, we get the ability to bluff. So, like, the combination of those with your equity to, like... And, like, making a six is pretty disguised, so is a seven, so you have, like, pretty good implies. Okay. Let's see if I can let's stop making you. Do we ever use offsuit hands as the true betting range versus the button? Or sorry, not offsuit hands, but uh, offsuit ASX hands that are like on the weaker side or once you get to these stack depths, is it just like you want to be suited ASX and just steer clear of the... Yeah, like I think like if you look at say like the solved ranges, hmm. uh, it would sometimes mix in some of the garbage ASX, but it's probably not worth anything. So I would just stick to like equity driven hands uh this is i was gonna say again another close spot actually when he snap checks river 
Um, okay, so that's like, again because it's didn't... pretty thin to think of valuing this, but the combination of like the way I would look at this spot is this is clearly a player who's just splashing about. Um, and the size he takes on turn combined again with his timing on the, the river, it sounds probably too thin to value that. But like if you have Jack 10, like definitely at least okay. think like that. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would, I would never value that on that Jack of Spades. So I would not find the yeah. value there. Like with Jack 10, not I'm saying, or with nine, sorry, not Jack 10. Jack 10, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. I, th I just think what you're probably doing a bit is it seems like you kind of have your mind made up sometimes on turn. As in, like, I'm going to check, like, this hand's worth this street, and that's it. Whereas, yeah. like, give your give yourself at least a second or two to reevaluate on river before you check. Can I open this? I fold it, but... Yeah, I think you can open this fine. Okay. Like, it's the weakest offsuit Broadway you should probably open with, like, sorry, king. Like, you wouldn't open king 10, but people, again, the only downside of a hand like king jack is if people are three-betting enough. And, like, I don't you've been three-bet once this video, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So. Have I missed any obvious tree bets so far? Like, uh, not that I recall. Like, I think yeah. you've been doing. Like, I like the size for what it's worth, the three point five. Um, like, you don't have to go that big in position in these spots, and you're gonna, you're obviously gonna want to pick one size with your range. So, just like that size is kind of a good catch all. Uh, but I think like you could probably look for a few more spots to be a bit more aggressive three betting again, because if you're not getting three bet enough means the pool's probably not getting three bet enough, so they're going to be very uncomfortable defending against three bets. So, you know, trying to make your opponents as uncomfortable as possible is how you make money at poker. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I feel it's always been something I've struggled with, even in uh, in tournaments that I just don't quite three bet enough. Just so See, here, you don't need to go this big again. Not to nitpick again, but, like, Where he's shallow, it? and he made it 3x already. You could just go to, like, 3x yourself. Okay. This is, um, all right, so this is my logic here because that's, I may as well tell you because I checked this turn and mm -hmm. yep. I feel like my hand, I don't know how opponents respond, but I felt like blocking like nines and eights wasn't good, but then I felt like unblocking any of the backdoor flushes. Not that the nine and eight are going to play too much there was good. Like, so I just wasn't sure because I felt like I was going to be in no man's land a lot if I bet here, so I was just going to delay bluff, but do I ever check any of my actual ASEX on the turn was my like question to myself in game. I know like it all happens really quickly, but like I was like, if I bet, if I check here, do I even get to bluff the rover or am I just giving up? So should I just like bet like basically if so, I bet kings, queens, jacks, tens, like do I want to be betting those hands at a frequency on this turn or are they all checks? Because that obviously changes the strategy a lot if you bet them. Yeah, I would I would mainly just like you're gonna end up just checking this turn a lot with your range. Okay. Um and like what that could look like is to make your strategy easy is like mainly just bet the ace x that you're 100 percent comfortable like stacking off with okay. so like ace king ace queen pure bet turn um and then just do a bunch of checking with like because your ace jack through say like ace eight or whatever bluffs you have they don't really want to go for three and they need no protection so yeah might as well allow your opponent to bluff river and check back turn okay all right so I'll, yeah okay that's on this river card, I feel like I have to <laughs> bluff, but like it's I don't know what size I should bluff. Like, you know? Why, yeah, why, so why, why do we giggle in a bed over there? Go on, tell me. The, the problem with this is there's a saying in poker that you never try and bluff a recreational player off a full house. Z by and, zero. But, yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if he just snap calls pocket <laughs> threes versus a bet. So, okay. I on the turn, I wasn't sure if I wanted to block nines or eights, but on the river, I felt like it was good to block these and like unblock like king queen and king jack sort of suited hands. So mm -hmm. I think I would have checked down with those hands and bluffed this. Like that was my logic. Um, yeah. But I obviously I agree. Like it wouldn't surprise me after I check in this turn if they just like snap me off a of pocket trees on the river, right? So the one thing I would say is, so with this bluff, you kind of expect them never to fold the full house, right? No, I, I do think that you're going to get some folds like pocket trees and pocket six. I don't think they're going to snap it every time, but I think we're going to get called. Like, it wouldn't surprise me to get called, but it also, like, I don't think it 100% people are going to call. You, okay. you don't agree? I, would, I think you get called quite often here, but <laughs> what I was going to say is on this river, you have the ability to, to like, you probably still be able to value that some man's worse than an ace now, right? If you have, like, jacks and stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so you could easily just have two sizes here and you could just put this into the size that mirrors your jacks and tens because you block his pocket nines and eights. So it kind of fits well on that half, size because those are the hands. Them. Yeah, so you half pot this one and then bigger bet your, say, better boats. 
Okay. Okay. So if I have an ace here, what size would you bet? Because I, I thought that we'd be targeting weaker hands, obviously, and I didn't think we'd want to go too big. Um, but yeah, I think this is fine. Like, okay. you don't want to, you don't really need to leverage. If you have like exactly quad somehow or like <laughs> a trickly played pocket fives, okay. you can go bigger. But like, yeah, yeah for the most part, you're just going to take that size. All right. But yeah, like the idea of like utilizing some of your hands you don't really want to bluff, but kind of block some of his best check calls and like the smaller sizing is pretty effective. Okay, that makes sense. How easy What's, is it for cash game players to uh, go over and crush tournaments when you guys are just so goddamn good? You just break down. You all you you all just break down. I know like you're like one of the top players in the pool, but like. You just break down things and it makes so much sense. And like I've been playing poker for years, and then you just say this to me. I'm like, God damn it, I am fucking terrible. I'm the worst. <laughs> well, I feel the same way whenever I get short. So like I, I feel like there's spots where because you're so used to playing 100 big blinds, your like relative hand strength threshold just like <laughs> it's like it's all out of whack. So sometimes like 15 big blinds, it feels weird for me to stack off with like you know second pair. And it's just like an easy stack off type. Yeah, thing. yeah. No, I get that, so, but that is easier to learn. I feel like you've had yeah. a few crossbars recently, right? It seems like you were knocking on a door in the tournament world in nine or was it twenty nineteen or twenty twenty all those crossbars were coming? It was this year. I I had a deep run in the W Coop phase. I came like I think fifteenth or something, and then I, I FT to W Coop. Um either W Coop or Scoop actually. As well, though? Sorry? Was there a big live tournament or am I Oh yeah, I came fifteenth in a live I've came fifth last year in one and then fifteenth this year in one heartbreak man all right yeah. so this hand i remember being quite interesting um the turn i felt like i should mix like i didn't know if i should just be pure betting but mm -hmm. i'm not 100 sure on that i also thought like if i'm gonna bet i should be betting big um and like i was trying to think like what the worst hand i would bet here is and i feel like it's two pair like i feel like this is about the worst hand i should bet or do you think i should be betting some king x as well just like to see if my thinking is right there yeah th probably like on the king like the way you kind of want to approach the spot is like an easy way to think of it is like when you bet turn, you're basically saying you beat ace king. Um, yeah. So if you can't beat ace king, you probably shouldn't bet turn. Yeah. Because yeah. like without bluffs, obviously. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. if you have like king ten, you're probably just going to want to check that hand on this turn, um, and that that protects your check range. This hand actually also is like fine to mix because like he does improve to some better hands on this turn. We. Also have to check a ton of rivers, so it's kind of nice to give ourselves some like check calls that like protect ourselves on say some of the brickier runouts. Because like if you say the best hand you check call here is like king ten, um, you're in kind of a gross spot on like a mm -hmm. river five if he yeah. uses like big bet sizes and stuff like that. Absolutely. Okay. So I did. I I I think I ended up betting, but it felt like a hand that I should probably be checking a reasonable amount. But you know the finty mix. If in doubt, bet it out anyway. But uh, we do end up betting. And then the thing is, like, this will also probably perform better than it should because he probably doesn't check like any flush draws, and you're gonna river an eight, so even better. Uh, <laughs> so now, like, hopefully, we use a really big size here, dude. I was gonna bet big and I ended up checking. It's uh, okay. like, like, once he calls turn, he probably would have bet most of his like bear clubs that are bluffing on the flop, and he's gonna have like more buff catchers probably than value. And we can leverage our flush advantage on this runout, so I would use like some sort of like 1.5x pot okay. size. I, I do tank and like I was I was considering betting large. I, it's interesting that it's like it caps out at kind of like 1.5x. He checked back a king here, which I guess is uh, something that will happen a lot. And I was kind of mad at myself. Um, yeah, like basically what I would think of in that spot is, is he going to like bluff that river more than he's going to like bluff catch? And then like, are we in a spot that we actually think we can stack him? Probably not. So like the value of check raise isn't that appealing because you're not going to like get to like check he over bets and you shove like those yeah. scenarios don't occur very often. So might as well just like maximize versus bluff catchers. This is the hand that I'm not sure if the, the last one I could tell it hurt your soul a little bit that I checked like a little bit of you died inside. I, I seen that. But <laughs> I want to know on this flop for starters if so when I think of these flops like I think we're going to be true betting uh, linearly from this position versus him, right? So, like, yep. should I just be betting this flop a lot? It feels like yes. But it also yep. feels like I could carve out a larger size in with, like, queens, kings, maybe some ace-jack. But I'm not sure if that's wrong because, like, they have eights and fives. So this is a flop straight away where I was a little bit not sure because we're out of stack depth. I just don't play, right? 
We're already mm-hmm. up past like 60 big blinds. I'm okay. But anything above is uncomfortable. And here we have over the 100 big blind stack. So what? how do you generally approach these flops given the positions? Yeah, I think like it's not actually that advantageous, especially for someone like in your shoes where you're still trying to like figure out these spots exactly at this depth. It's probably not worth having like too many different sizes on flop. So especially in these more narrow range spots. So if you want like a catch-all size, it'd be probably better just like use like a half pot size with range rather than like sometimes blocking and sometimes big betting. It'll just like make things more complicated than you need to. So like somewhere around half pot would probably be a good spot because you're just kind of leveraging your overpair advantage. Um, even a hand like tens doesn't, it's not like it loses that much using the half pot size here, especially if your opponent doesn't check raise enough. So just using kind of like a half pot size is probably good and just like really leveraging the fact that you're a bit deeper and a hand like pocket sevens is going to understand that he's going to have to withstand a lot of aggression on future street so he might overfold flop a little bit okay so i think i end up just doing what i do in tournaments and betting one third with a lot of my range on these boards but the what you're saying just makes a lot of sense it just does simplify the game and if you can get some of those heuristics it's just nice isn't it like where you just don't have to overthink it mm-hmm. well because now now we're gonna have to overbet yeah which is good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to try and play for stacks here. Um, do you think I should be overbetting bigger potentially? I think to get stacks and you have to go a bit bigger than this. And this is basically compounded by the fact we went a bit too small on flop. Okay. It, it's it's not miles off though, right? Like it'll be 15 and then it'll be 42 on the river. So it's Yeah, like, it'll be a bit of a, yeah. Just like overbet, so overbet. What type of, of nitty check are we making? No, we're not making a nitty check, mate. We're not. Oh, I, I know. Check. So he shoves here. But not only does he shove, he shoves on a card that doesn't make the flush. And did you see how quick he shoved that? So before <laughs> you, before, so I guess you would call right. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to be ridiculed for this one. But I would have called like all the other kings, but I just felt like this suits of all the kings the hero call on the river. Like this one just didn't make sense. And I just, from my experience playing poker, I don't play cash games, and it could be just like a more random factor where people do stuff like this. But when people snap shove all in on rivers, like they just have a really strong hand, like almost always. Now, I know not too many draws completed, but 9 10 did get there. Queen Jack is certainly a hand that our opponent could have that wasn't comfortable check raising. Now, and I know that's not a lot of combos because 9 10 of spades probably check raises on the flop a reasonable amount. So it's like five combos, and then like there's just random shit that they just have, right? So. I felt when I played this hand that you might be like, you just don't get the fold out now. Put the chips in the middle and shut the fuck up. But at the same time, I just felt like I wasn't winning. So, Ryan, am I an idiot? Yes or no? Uh, I don't think you're an idiot. I think this spot's like, this is one of those spots where you could run this spot over and over again and like Pyle may tell you to call every time. But like, we've played enough poker in our lives to know exactly what you just said. Like, he's not showing up here with like king tens of hearts probably even. Like, he just might fold that flop he might not take this random line on river um so if he's mainly value based it's kind of a gross spot like i typically wouldn't fold this hand like curiosity would just like make me call but it could be just a good exploitative fold here like we also have um like eights queens ourselves but like outside of that we have aces that don't block the flush draws we maybe have some 10 nine suited ourselves but for the most part this is like you know top of our range and it's not great having this exact combo. So if you to- tell me you folded this exact combo and called everything else, I honestly don't no, think it's honestly, terrible. I would... Uh, you you think it was terrible because I was going to fold the other kings? Or if you, if you, as long as you call the other ones, I think like that. Oh, yeah, great. no, that's... I was going to call the other kings. I'm not just saying that. That was pretty much the last interesting hand that went down in this session. The rest of it was uh, mostly me folding, which is going to happen a lot in Zoom. If there's anything, what would you say? Uh, don't what cliffs? If you got any cliffs, if you noticed anything, yeah. I know it's thirty minutes of play is nothing, right? Like it's really hard to make an assessment, and I've never really played cash games before. But is there anything that sticks out that if I'm going to continue to do this, play some cash games for YouTube, and maybe you'll join in f- future sessions? Like, what would you be looking out for? Yeah, so like the, the the one obvious one we talked about, like less flatting from say like the cutoff and MP, like employ do you think more. I should of incorporate that into mtts um i think the same thing you would do in this scenario would apply well to mtts is like always take a second to look behind you see like you have if you have like 
see Darwin behind you, obviously you're not going to flat as much. Yeah, and I, kind do, of I do do that at the moment, but do it even more so. Yeah, like look at who you want to play pots against and then put yourself in the best spot to play pots against those people. Um, and so that would mean you can still flat selectively, but like defaulting to a flat with some of those hands is going to cost you more money than it'll like generate for you. Um, three bet a bit smaller in position just as a general and also like look to be a bit more aggressive with your three bets. And then the only other bigger thing was like making sure that we're not like snap checking river. So give yourself like a second or two to like think before you assume your hands a check on the river. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start trying to look for some tin value and it's probably going to go terribly wrong, but I will try my best. Ryan, thank you very much uh, for helping me out. Uh, I really enjoyed it. If people are looking for you, they can find you on Twitter at poker or risk with an E. Where else can I find you? Uh, Twitch, YouTube, and Instagram, all, all poker with risk for all those. So I will link it below. And if you want to get in touch with Ryan, um, like you mentioned earlier on, he does do a coaching for profits. And if you want to be very impressed and just go look at his Twitter. He posts graphs all the time. He's not so humble. He comes across as a nice guy, but all he does is brag all day. No, I'm Thank you very much, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we can do it again. Right. Thank you.